I'm Max Ashler, CEO of Sales Hacker. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Brandon Redlinger from Engageo uh, is joining me on the webinar, and we're going to go through a couple uh, cold emails and also uh, cold follow-ups, I guess you'd call it, um, talk about what to do, what not to do, and more interestingly, like Brandon here, you're a marketer. Um, you're getting sold to uh, way more than probably anybody else. Uh, you know, uh, marketing is uh, holding probably one of the biggest budgets in a lot of these different organizations. Clearly, you just raise a lot of money. You're probably getting that exact email. It's like, hey, congratulations on the $22 million, you know, Series B or whatever it is. Uh, never been a better time to invest in whatever I'm selling you. You know, like the, you know, okay, great. Everybody's got, you know, um, some news alerts that or they're using a service that allows them to, to understand those triggers, but and that's not enough anymore. It's not, you know, it's not authentic. So um, we're going to dive into these, you know, some of these cold emails that you're getting, and would love to hear more about, you know, from your point of view as the person that you know we're all selling to, or some of the that we're selling to, you know, what what's going to going to make you act? And we'll use some things from the ebook um, as well. So I'll uh, I'll kick it over to you, and then we'll get into these emails in a second. All right, great, love it. Thanks, Max. Yeah, really excited uh, to be talking about this topic. I know it's uh, something that we've just been going back and forth on, Max, of uh, like, here are some fun, good cold emails, um, and just kind of critiquing them on our own. But um, yeah, we, we wrote the ebook because I think you can learn a lot of what not to do by looking at some of these some of these bad examples. So may, it may not be obvious, or it may be pretty obvious not to do these things, but everyone starts somewhere, and I think everyone can always be improving on their cold emails. So um, this is, again, really meant to be an educational piece. Um, hopefully it's actually a, a little entertaining at the same time, and then, um, again, as Max said, we can look at these through the lens of, all right, you're selling to me, a marketer, um, what would I actually be looking for? What would I respond to? What would I like? And I know I am exposing myself here. I might be getting a lot of cold emails after this webinar, um, but as long as they're good cold emails, um, I, I will respond. So we, we shall see. Otherwise, you might be featured in Crappy Cold Email <laughs> ebook number two. <laughs> um, all right. So you can get the, so you should have got it already, but if you want to get it again, um, you can just go to engageo.com slash crappy email ebook, and that is on our resource center. Um, if, or you can just go to engageo.com slash resources. Um, you can find it. It's the first thing front and center there. Um, and we, again, had a lot of people, a lot of experts chiming in, and we aimed for more practitioners. So people actually writing cold emails, people actually coaching their team on how to do this, not just you know, thought leaders giving generic advice out there. These are the people in the trenches um, who are reviewing some cold emails and hopefully teaching us how to send better cold emails. So again, just go to engageo.com slash crappy email ebook and you can uh, download it there for free. You won't have to re-input your, your uh, information or anything. Um, all right, so let's get into some of the cold email critiques. So we, we have a few cold email critiques. We have a few email follow-up critiques, and then we have a few examples of some actual good emails that we have received, uh, and then we'll follow it up. We will end the webinar with some of our top tips. We'll, we're giving away five of our top tips. Um, the other five can be found in the ebook itself. Um, so that said, all right, here's, <laughs> here's the first email, um, and like immediately, right away, subject line. Pretty, pretty boring, pretty generic. I think one of the common, um, the common pieces of advice in the ebook itself from the experts was like the, your subject line is the very first thing. It's like the ad for the email itself. Like make your subject take some time and spend it on making your subject line good. Make it compelling. And that's super generic subject line, right? Uh, we've all. It's got the it. gatekeeper. The gatekeeper to exactly. email. Yeah. So what we used to do uh, at Udemy is we would, you know, you'd have an email tracking 
app that you use so you can see uh, open rates, click-through rates, all those types of things. And then you can do a multivariable or an A-B test and say, okay, we'll, you know, we'll send to a similar size of the list, you know, whether that's 100 or 250 people, um, depends on like the type of company or the type of people you're selling to. But mm -hmm. on a similar size and a similar persona, we'll send two different subject lines with the same email and see, you know, which one gets more open. Then we'll go with that subject line. Then we'll test it against another one that's slightly different. Then we'll go with that one. And you can keep testing them against each other until you find, you know, the appropriate, the, the gatekeeper that you know is going to work best. So, you know, there are some people that say they like to put, you know, company name in the uh, subject line. Uh, some people that say, name. exactly, the person's first name. Like, you can test all those for who you're selling to. So in sales, there's no silver bullet. You know, I can't sit here and tell you that, you know, what works for me is going to work for you if we have completely different businesses. We're selling to completely different people. What I can exactly. tell you to, how to do is how to figure out what's going to work best for you. So what will work best for you is A-B testing, pick two different subject lines, find a similar persona and a similar group of your list, make sure it's enough people on that list that you know you have a, like a, enough data to go off of and say, okay, this is actually, this isn't a fluke. If you send it to three people, that's not enough because, yeah, you might just find the, the right three people. If you have 100 people, you know, then you're saying, okay, well, there's enough people in this group to validate the results and say that, okay, this is, this is something that I can trust. So something you want to start doing is A-B testing those lines for the people that you're selling to um, and, you know, try it for yourself. I mean, there's some things that you're going you're gonna to get feedback on that, are, that people are like, well, I didn't like that you used the, the company in my, in my email. And there's some people that might come back and say, well, I really liked that you did that. It made it feel more personal. Um, if you're talking to, like, the more tech-savvy individual, like if you're selling into more tech companies, they're going to know that you probably used um, – some email template that allows you to put their company in the subject line. They're not going to think it's, it's personal at all. And if you're selling to maybe someone who's a little bit more like, you know, old school and doesn't know that that technology exists, might think that, you know, uh, wow, they, they, this is an email just to me and my name or my, uh, you know, company is in the subject line. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great part. And, and also, when it comes to A-B testing your subject lines, remember the subject line is like, the, you, you would be testing the open rate, right? Um, so if you're looking at, well, I would actually also say, like, if you're testing your subject line, don't change anything else in, you know, you have your sample set. You have, you know, 100 people, or, you know, hopefully more than 100 people, 500 people, mm -hmm. um, hopefully very similar personas. Split it right down the middle. And don't also, you know, change the subject line, but also change the body of the email and also change the call to action because that's actually going to skew your your results. You won't actually know what the thing was that um, you know gave you the better response. So when you're testing subject lines, only change the subject line. Don't change everything else. Um, yeah. And, and then just looking looking at this email again, like the the second thing that I noticed is he sent it out via Tout app. So I know it's a it's an automated email. I know I'm on a list of hundreds of other people who he's targeting with this, and the entire message it's it's very generic. It, it just says hello. It doesn't even say my name. It doesn't say anything. Um, and <laughs> I, I I this is actually the first one that I got that uh, was in the third person. So James is writing to me. You will say that James is reaching out to you out of the blue here. I, I've never gotten any others that are talking or writing in, in, the, in the third person. So I, I just thought that was kind of funny. I don't think you need to do that. Um, no. And then the, the rest of the email itself is very boring, very generic, and actually copywriting matters a lot here. So it's not just like the words that you say, it's also like how you say them. Uh, it's not, just not the message itself, it's like how you actually deliver that message. So if you look at the first paragraph, or the first line of the second paragraph, uh, it's actually very poorly written. Um, part of efforts and really a great source of our idea, idea pool is someone like you who has a need for a custom program campaign tool targeted yeah. towards, yeah, it's just like, I don't, I don't even know what that means. Um, so we actually go into this in the ebook a little bit 
And it was yeah. fun. It was, it was something that our, our our critiquers, our judges, actually picked out. Um, you know, if if English isn't your first language, then you know, go on Fiverr.com or you know Upwork or something like that. If nobody in the company speaks English, and have people you know approve the copy or tweak the copy for you, because if you're selling into people who whose English is their first language, you know, they're already going to be biased against that if you're making those errors. And if you're just like a really bad writer, maybe you need to go on Fiverr and just have somebody help you put that together better. Because I, you know, I don't know if you should should be in sales if you can't communicate people in the first place. But you know, if you can't if you can't put together an email that's not riddled with spelling errors or grammatical errors or whatnot, you know, uh, that's pretty bad, and that's going to lose people right away. Now, looking at this email, I think like at some point with the generations changing. Um, and the world kind of progressing in general, um, emails replaced letters. And now that we have texting, people don't really send like handwritten letters anymore. So your email should actually come off more as text messages that people are actually used to, like, used to doing in their daily lives than they should like, indi like individual handwritten letters. So you're going to write this much text, you're going to lose somebody right off the bat. You want to make your emails read more like text messages than emails, um, and I think like you know you look at a, a, a message like this, and you would never, nobody would ever text you something like this. No. So definitely, you got to cut it down. Um, there's too much copy. There's uh, also something that you know you don't learn in like grade school English class, but you know use enter more often. Like there's no reason why this person couldn't break up that entire you know second paragraph into one or two more paragraphs. It's not about, you know, MLA format. This isn't a this isn't your, you know, high school English class. This is about making this thing really easy to read for someone, not just on desktop but on mobile where most people are are reading their emails for the first time. Like especially if I get if I'm, you know, in the car or something like that in an Uber and I get an email from someone I've never seen before, I'm cleaning out my inbox when I'm <laughs> on the road. So I'm marking that as read or deleting it or whatever it is. And I'm not going into it if it's on mobile and you've already lost me. So like that's the first chance you have to actually get me to to you know read your email. So like coming at you from a you know a salesperson who actually sells, you know, and also a CEO of a company who gets sold to a ton. That's how I'm going through my inbox, and that's how I'm you know responding to people. I'm using Enter a lot um, to space things out. Yeah, white space is your friend. It makes it so much easier on the eyes to read. Even if it's the same length, like it just feels easier to read when you have the double hard return. Um, all right, let's move on to the next one. Yeah. So, crappy email number two. Um, again, like very presumptuous subject line there um, that, that does nothing for me. And then you can see his, he's sending this one from his personal Gmail, and his personal Gmail actually looked pretty strange also. It ended in X00, and then at the, at the bottom in his signature, it was actually his company email. Um, so that, that kind of threw me off. And then here's another email that's just like, hello, instead of, hey, Brandon, like, what's up? She's like, hello. Um, <laughs> so, like, I, I like my name. I th everyone likes their name. I don't, like use use the people's names. Um, and then here, this was another um, uh, common thing that we saw a lot, and that you'll see in some of these other critiques too. Is you don't know me, but like the, I think that's a, the worst way to start. Yeah, I, I'll, I obviously know if I know you or not. You don't need to say that. And that's like selling from your heels, right? That's like pulling your yeah. punches. Um, and I think that's yeah. the worst thing that you can do as a salesperson. Like, d don't back down. Like, sh like show up, and show up strong. Yeah. That's not a good way to show up. You don't know me, yeah. but yeah, my name is, or you don't know me, or anything like that. Why? Like, I know what your name is. It says it on the top of the email. It says it in yeah. the signature. Like, you don't need to. You don't need to get into that. You don't need to get into the the. You know, you don't know me. Don't come from a, a point of weakness. Um, and it's definitely, you know, again. Going back to the text message sentiment, you only have so much time to reel this person in, and so many really words that you're going to work with in this email that they're going to read. Don't waste them. 
on any of like, like filler, uh, anything that people can see through. Like I don't even start these things with like hope you are well. Like, that, like yep. that's you're that adds you're nothing. you're wasting. Yeah, it adds nothing. We we all know what we're here for. Provide value for me. Look like do some research. Show that you know. Challenge me, flatter me, or provide value for them. Um, I think in those three situations, you're going to have a lot better of a time getting in and getting in right off the bat if you can do those three things. Exactly, exactly. And then paragraph two right there says, "I studied your web or I studied your company via your website quite extensively." Um, for me, that was like, you don't prove that at all here. Anyone can say that without ever, ever, ever having to do that to get my response, like, I want to actually see. I want you to demonstrate that you've visited my site, that you know something about me and my business, um, instead of just saying, oh, but I, I've studied you. Like, you have no idea what my business is about. Um, so I, I thought that was also very, very off-putting to me. Like, don't tell me, demonstrate it to me. That's how you're going to get my attention. Do you have, you know, as somebody who gets told to quite often, you know, even if you are interested in or semi-interested, do you have a preference on, uh, you know, the end of this email here? So do you have time to get on a call? Do you, do you like when people call out a time? Do you like when people give you a list of times? What makes it easier for you? Yeah, I, so I like it when someone's like, um, you know, I, I'm pretty flexible Thursday morning before 5 or before 10 or Wednesday after 5. Um, so then I can jump to my, like, it's, it's uh, like, specific enough without, like, um, having to go, keep going back and forth. So I can just reply, like, yeah, all right, 9 o'clock a.m. Wednesday or, yeah, 5. Yeah. On so it's just, like, um, so. Time ranges. Yeah, it, like ranges work best. Um, exactly. All right, Let's check let's the next go to the next one. Um, again, same thing in the subject line. Like, um, I, I don't know how many times <laughs> we need to say that. We'll probably say that for every email here. Um, and then one interesting thing about this email it was the team selling it to my team. So it says team at company. And in the signature, it was company's sales team. I don't want to, I don't want someone, like, everyone kind of yeah, has a weird. negative reaction to salespeople anyway. So it's like, hey, just a heads up, like, I'm selling to you, so put your guards up. You know, that's like warning me. Yeah. Um, and then also, it's not to me, it's to sales at Engageo.com. Like, do you really think you're going to get a reply from someone if you send it to the entire team? Um, I don't think so. Yeah, and the then, other funny thing in here is like, what is Clutch.co? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what that is? Like, if it's not a, if it's not something that everybody knows what it is, how how are you going to say that it's, you know, a, a trusted resource, or try and say that it's a trusted resource? Like, that's just a, a weird thing to do. So a lot of times, I think people try and. Um, Say we work with X, Y, and Z brands, or do something to make them to make their themselves sound more credible. Um, mm -hmm. I'd say that third-party results or data. I actually like that. I think it goes a long way if it's an actual trusted resource. Yes. So, and even if it's not about your what you're selling in general, but it, but it's about your product value, then it it makes it actually really interesting. So I think we had um, a crappy email that came in. Um, and they, like, I remember looking at this one, like, they did one thing right. I remember they did one thing right, and it was using that third party data. It was like, uh, you know, Gartner says that, you know, 83% of marketers, you know, X, Y, and Z. It's yep. like, okay, Gartner's a trusted resource. It gives you some, like, some data about the product value or the area that you're going to be using, um, you know, this thing in, this product in. Like, that's a good way to start. And then you got to connect that. And you don't want to, I don't think you necessarily want to talk about people's competitors in the email, like we work with all of your competitors. Um, sometimes that might turn people off even, especially if you're collecting data, uh, you know, or, you know, opening up, for example, uh, you get everything in our sales force. Like, I don't, yeah, I don't exactly. want you working with us and our competitors if, I, if, I'm, if you're asking me to open up my sales force to you. 
you know, okay, that's like a, that's a non-starter. So working with like third-party data reports and things that people trust, I think works. Um, but they got to know what it is. Like I don't know what Clutch.co is. Um, you know, is yeah. that what is that? I don't know. Yeah, when when I first when I first opened this email, so I mean, a lot of the emails that I, a lot of the cold emails I open, I actually just skim really quickly, and I actually thought for a second Clutch.co was who this person was selling, not here's another resource, Clutch.co. And another thing that was interesting about this email, they have actual terms capitalized. So I'm reading through this, skimming through it, and I, like the capitalized terms kind of stick out to me. And I was like, oh wait, is Quality Check the name of the company? Oh no, I guess it's not. Clutch.co might be the company. Oh no, wait, is it Software Quality? Is that the name of the company? Like I'm trying to skim this very quickly and all these yep. capitalized um, words that shouldn't be capitalized really just completely threw me off. Or is that a product they have? Like I don't, I don't quite get it. Um, yeah. Unless I actually read the email word for word, which no one reads cold emails word for word unless like they're really uh, riveted by the first thing that they see and it just carries them through the rest of the email, which definitely not the case here. I'm going to go through some questions real quick that we had cool. come in. So um, how many paragraphs would you say is too much? I was under the impression you want to make the whole email readable on mobile without scrolling. Um, I think it's a French philosopher, but I, you know, it's random, but I love this, this saying. It's, uh, he said, sorry this letter is so long, I didn't have time to make it shorter. Right. So exactly. basically what you want to do is, and you'll get really good at this if you do this over time, what you want to do is you want to write the email, uh, you know, with everything that you want included in it that you think, uh, you know, first obviously do your homework, do your research, make it as long as you as you want to make it with all the elements you want added to it. And then once you have that written out, go back and make it more concise. Cut out all the fluffy words, the wasted sentences, the how are you doing, hope are you are well, my name is, um, even words like truly or absolutely any kind of filler words. Like you can Google words that are like filler words and I'll, you'll probably find a Forbes article like 50 words not to use unnecessary you know, words in your, in your uh, email communications or your writing. I mean these are all things that you can just cut out in your emails and start making them more concise. Start understanding, okay, like this isn't relevant or necessary at this stage or in this note or you know, you're not trying to close the deal on this email, like that's not the point of the email. The point of the email is to get to the next step, which is, you know, the call, the conversation. Um, so, you know, how are you writing this email in order to, to, to get to that goal, not to get the deal closed? You don't need to put in all the information about your product. You just need to get them to a point where they're going to agree to have a conversation with you, or they're even just going to respond to this in a positive manner, or even in like a neutral manner, but it's not a no, to get to the yep. next point, to give you that opening. So write, you know, put everything down, you know, when you're going to write these emails. And I'm not saying you need to do this every day for every individual email. Like even if you're sending emails one off for enterprise deals, you can still go and do this and then like have an idea about what you're going to talk about for different personas. So if you're doing more of like, uh, you know, a mass emailing thing, like I don't know your business, but if you're doing more of a mass emailing, at least do the 108010 method, which is Go out and, and, you know, take your total adjustable market list or whatever list you're working on, segment those lists down into smaller buckets based on three common denominators. So, for example, um, VPs of sales in Boston in healthcare, you know, so you could pick a title, an industry, and, uh, and um, a location or a geo. And then once you have that smaller list, then you can make those emails more uh, personalized to just those people on that list. So like the, the intro paragraph and the, out, the intro sentence and the outro sentence could be more personalized to that list. And then the middle chunk can be more generic. And this way it looks like more of a personalized email. So that's one way to do it if you're doing more of a mass uh, emailing strategy. I'd say for like the smaller deals, you can get away with that. For enterprise deals, anything account-based that you're doing one-off type stuff, um, you know, you're going to want to write more of a personalized message. So you're going to want to go in and, and actually do some research, find some, 
some apps uh, out there that will help you pull together a dossier on people so you can do it a lot faster. You can leverage a virtual assistant um, you know, on Upwork to help you do that a lot quicker. But you're going to want to write those emails out, go back, make them clearer, make them more concise, um, and you'll understand exactly how to break them out. And then anytime you see a, a really meaty paragraph, just forget everything you learned in high school English class, really, and like use use enter, use that button because people aren't reading them. You know, people are reading it on mobile. They they're just going to see a screen full of letters if you're not uh, getting a little more free with you know the, the the enter button. So like even on this email, I would probably press enter after the word you know or the words clutch.co resource. Like break that up even just one more one more time just to make it nice and clean. I know it. It might flow uh, sometimes for you, but you really just want to make it super easy to read. Um, and I would change a lot of things about this email. So, you know, I'm just saying, if you're giving it the eye test, like what would make that look better? What would make that easier to read right off the bat? And less daunting. Like I might not, I might see just a screen full of letters and just completely get out of it immediately. Uh, just because it's a screen full of letters, like I haven't, even, I don't even need to read one word. I just know it's hard to read, and like I don't have the time. Done. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, even if it's like, oh, you know what? I, I kind of care about this subject or this, um, you know, product. I'm interested. I'll read it later. And we all know later means never. Like you, you never get around to reading a cold email. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely use use the white space, cut it down, and and look at like every word and every sentence and ask yourself. Does this add value? Does this add value? If not, cut it out. Okay. Um, and then I think also this is where copywriting comes in again. There are a lot of people out there who write sentences that are, you know, 20 um, words long where they could have said the exact same thing in 12 words. Like that stuff matters a lot. Like these small things really add up. And once you learn to do that, you can really pack a powerful punch in a very short email that actually lands pretty well. Um, all right, let's move on to the next one. All right. Um, so this one was, um, so I would say, first off, don't lie in an email. I, I never had a meeting with this, <laughs> with this um, company. And I did not meet them at Dreamforce. And again, here's another person selling from their heels. You probably don't remember, but we uh, met and spoke at Dreamforce. Actually, to me, this just was, hey, buddy, I did a list swap with someone, and now I'm emailing you. That, that's like yeah. all this was to me. And I immediately like broke my trust. I was like, nope, I don't know this person. I didn't meet with them. Like, delete. Yeah, and you know what? It's funny because like, a lot of companies will look at this and say, like, Oh well, it, it didn't matter because we we put this in the queue and uh, it got sent and like we can always catch up with him later. But you'll remember, like you'll you'll know next time you actually hear from somebody at this company, like you already start from a point of distrust. So you're yep. they're burning their first touch and they're thinking that like oh it's just somebody in a in an you know an email batch that we did a list swap on whatever we'll. We'll you know find a way in at some point later on. It's all good if this works. Yeah, if it doesn't like, it didn't hurt us. It does hurt you. Like I remember these things too. And you're a marketer, so uh, you're, you know, you know how these people are working. Like you just said exactly what probably just happened. And I bet you you're like 99% right. So they're sending this email to a marketer. Like they should have at least segmented that list out and you know. <laughs> sent it to people who maybe weren't thinking in similar ways. I don't know. I mean, it's already clearly uh, giving you a, ne a, a such a negative effect. We put it in an ebook or a <laughs> webinar about crappy emails, right? So you know, if you're one of those people who thinks that like, oh, if they don't open it, it's all good. We'll get to them later. And you're doing a crappy effort. Like this is how much a first impression actually matters. Like. You actually took this. We put this in a webinar on crappy email. So, you know, if you think it doesn't matter that you're sending, you know, a bulk email that's really shitty and you know, or pulling this kind of a move, yeah, people remember. Like I, I see this all the time. 
I know which companies are doing it right and which companies are doing it wrong. And we work with a lot of VPs of marketing, obviously with a, a media company and you know sponsorships and conferences and stuff. Um, and I, you know, I'm usually, I, I love it. I love seeing like the different personalities and personas of VP of marketing and and who who's like more volume, who's more you know uh, quality, you know, focused, all those different types of things. But it's a, a tangent a little bit, but. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Like, this is a, an example of kind of burning that that first touch. And if you think it's just like, oh, they're not going to see this, they're not going to read this. Like, you might be wrong. Don't want to risk burning that kind of that first touch or that first impression. Yeah, e exactly. And and like, we all know list swaps happen. And I I am yeah. fine if they do a list swap and you email me, but like, make yeah. it relevant. Like, yeah. that's that's fine. But the fact that you got the email is not the problem. The exactly. fact that like the email is already lying to you and like building yes. a distrust is the problem. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think the, the other thing um, about this email is coordinating five minutes on my calendar. Um, I, I know it's not going to take five minutes. No phone call ever takes five minutes. Yeah. Not even the the quick ones that really like should be five minutes, but there's no way you're going to sell or qualify me or anything within five minutes. Um, I think people see right through that. So give them something more realistic. Maybe maybe say fifteen or twenty, but like five. No, there's no way. Mm -hmm. All right, on to the next one. Um, so I think this one mainly. So this one was sent to to John, our CEO. Not me, but I think it illustrated actually one of the points that we already actually hit on a few times is use freaking white space, double hard return. Like he has a list here. Here's how we're different. And then lists four things. And it's in a paragraph form. This is perfect for a list that I can actually easily read. Um, and this, again, very, very generic. Um, it does absolutely nothing for me. And again, selling from this person's heels. I know you must be getting, you know, so many emails, like people must be annoying the hell out of you, but I'm going to do it also. It's like calling it out doesn't mean that it's now okay to do. So do something different. Do something that's actually going to get my attention. Like I see what you're kind of trying to do, be honest, but um, it's not working, not for this guy. Yeah, and you know, it's it needs to be spaced out. Like I, I don't know anybody who communicates in any language that thinks that this is going to get read. Like even if he was, and he's and like the, you're the CEO of the company. Like you know, it's almost like honestly, if you're if you pull the CEO to CEO move, or if you pull a CEO to anybody move, the less information is better. It, it's you're trying to come from a, a place of strength. And so you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily give a ton of details. Yep. So, yeah, for I mean, example, like if you're a billionaire, you probably don't have a LinkedIn profile. You don't need a LinkedIn <laughs> profile. You're a billionaire. Like, you, like you don't need to give any information. It's almost yep. like the better you, the, like the the most legitimate people that are on, like that are probably on LinkedIn, probably don't have a lot of information on it because they don't need that. But you already know who they are. Google them. They're they're good. So if you're a CEO sending another email to, a, to another CEO, you're not like selling them. You're talking to them from a, a position of strength saying, hey, um, you know, uh, really impressive how you're, you know, you've grown your company. Would love to connect on that, tell you a little bit about, about what we're doing. Like simple, really simple because it's, you're trying to, you're trying to come across as an equal, even if they're a much bigger company. You know, if I were to send a, uh, an email to the CEO of Dropbox, I may or may not get a response, but I'm not sending him a sales email. I'm mm -hmm. sending him an email flattering him on his success as a CEO and trying to get on the same level as like, hey, you know, I'm a young CEO, entrepreneur, blah, 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 coming up in like, the, you know, the same way you came up. Trying to, trying to do the flattery and provide value, but also would love to talk to you about what I'm doing. Now, I don't know if I'm, that's going to get me in touch, but it's definitely going to one make me look better, and two make me come off better than um, 
you know, here's a sales pitch. Like that's not even gonna get that's not gonna get past the gatekeeper. That's not gonna get read at all. I have I have a much better chance of getting past any gatekeeper or um, getting into his you know into his schedule or even just frame of mind if I go that route instead of the uh, here's a sales pitch route. So I know you guys talk a lot about playbooks and there's a play you know where the CEO sends a, you know an email to the other CEO. And even in those emails, like those aren't sales emails. Like those, those the sales pitch emails should only be coming from sales reps, uh, from anybody else. Um, you know, if you're trying to back channel or, or go through like VP of marketing or something like that, it shouldn't be a sales email. It should be a, a value add or a conversation or something like that that opens it up to the sales conversation. Yeah, the, the only time the CEO is telling it is if they're a super small company and he's still the only salesperson there. That's the only time a CEO is really selling. Um, but bottom line, CEOs don't have time to write emails like this. They usually don't write the sales emails. And on the other end, CEOs don't read these types of emails either. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Yep. Next, next up, we have um, this one was actually sent to one of our engineers, and it's, um, again, calling it out right away. Hey, I'm trying to sell to your company. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think that's a good reason why I should help you. It's saying, hey, yeah. I'm trying to do this. Can you help me? No, like, give me an actual compelling reason to respond, to care. And the, the CTA is, let's jump on the phone so you can help me figure out who I can sell to. This, yep. like, this missed on all marks, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, the it would have been one thing if they were just like, "Hey, can you forward this along to the right person?" But to get on a two-minute call, to, to like, I mean, it's that's bad enough, even with the forward along. But to get on a two-minute call, I mean, what are you, what are you thinking? Like, what? Yeah. I don't know. It just seems like. Uh, you just kind of, it's all me, me, me. That's exactly what this email is. So in going back to like what I would respond to, if, if you were like, hey, Brandon, we, um, like, I've been trying to get in touch with Ray. I know he's in Atlanta this week. Um, and like, you have something or a, a really compelling, short, quick, sweet value prop that I actually care about. It's like, look, I'm trying to get in touch with Ray. Um, like, do you mind putting me in touch with it? Like, I, I'll do that if it's something that I care about and I know you're actually doing your homework. I know you've actually put some effort into it. Anyone can send these emails out to everyone else at a company saying, hey, can you put me in touch? Or, hey, can you tell me who the yeah. right person to speak is? To, like, you know we like to at do? least tried. We, we like to do some back channels. So if you're doing like really, you know, big deals, you know, we'll, we'll go into like Amazon Web Services, for example, and we'll find somebody that somebody in our organization has in common with somebody in their organization. It doesn't even matter how close it is, you know, as long as it's in the same kind of silo or close to the same silo of that organization to the person you're trying to get in touch with. But if you could find somebody in your org, say, that like went to the same college as somebody in their org, then you can actually have them write an email to that person and start a conversation based on that. Start up something on a something that's like already uh, a trust builder or a almost like a brotherhood or alumni network or something like that. So yeah, things like same team, sports like, team, same hometown, same college, you know, any same high school, whatever it is. Yeah, and then you earn the the intro to you know through the back channel, like you know. Hey, you went to the same college, go Mustangs, whatever. And then yep. you have that conversation with them for a little bit, and then you earn the, the introduction to somebody else on that team. Um, that's a really great way to, to get in and, and do a back channel. And it only takes a little bit more, you know, effort on those bigger deals. Uh, but this is, you know, this, this is, just isn't going to work. Um, <laughs> it doesn't work anymore. I mean, it worked. It, there was a time when, like, you know, it worked a little bit. There was a time, but it's just uh, that time was probably three to five years ago. Yeah, at, at the very least. And like once you figure out something that works for you, you like don't be surprised if next year it stops working. Um, I think going back to kind of what we were saying earlier is A-B testing, you should actually always be A-B testing because what 
works, other people will then catch on to it, and then, of course, obviously, it loses its effectiveness. Um, so always, always be trying to think of new creative ways to uh, reach people, and, and I think the main thing is, like, be personal, be human, um, and spend some actual time doing some research. It doesn't take that much to find out that, you know, I, where I went to college, and there's a good chance that someone at your organization or someone you know went to the same college. It's, it's not that hard to do. It's just taking the time to actually do the work. Yeah. I'm going to go into a question that we keep seeing here. So people are wondering about adding links um, into email. So one thing that I, you know, that I really like doing is putting links in signatures. So right under your signature, you would have a really long link that it is basically the headline of a, an article about your company. Um, this is a really good one. So for example, if, like, if your company raised, you know, when I was at Udemy, TechCrunch wrote an article, Udemy raises $12.5 million to democratize education or whatever, some boring headline, but yeah, cool, raise money, whatever. That's great for the tech crowd, but not great for the people that I'm selling to, which are instructors. So what you can do is you basically recreate the headline you say uh, Udemy raises twelve and a half million dollars to um, open up access for educators to online courses or something like that, or help uh, help educators make more money. Whatever it is, whatever the like the value prop is, and that's what you use. And then you link that to the article in TechCrunch. So now you have a link to share third-party resource that's promoting your company, and you're using your sales copy in that link. As far as adding other links. Within your within the body of your email, um, I don't do it too much. If you do, make sure you're only linking like one word and not like a whole big thing. Um, I just don't like taking people out of the the email. I mean, you you want them you want them to respond and have a conversation. So if you offer too many other calls to action, you might get those other calls to action. So don't give them too many things that they can do with that email. Like right now, I get an email and I either respond or delete it. You know, if you give me an email and I can also click a link, then it's respond, delete, or click link. If you give me like three links, then I can click three links, respond or delete. Like now, I'm, now all of a sudden, there's a million different things that I can do. What if I open a link and that link's not interesting to me? Then you just oversold. You know, you add me. I was interested, and then I opened up that link, and it was something generic that you share with everybody else, or it was a broken link or something like that. Or, you know, now there's like blue highlighting all over your email and it's making it hard to read. Um, I would stick to, to keeping it as simple as possible and again recognizing that, you know, you want to you want to get them to the next step. Whatever that next step is, like make it easier for them to go to that next step. You're not trying to close the deal on one email. Uh, agreed. Agreed hundred percent. Like same advice. Um, you know, one, one link at the most, and, and also you have to be careful because some spam filters look at how many links you're actually linking out to, and it could affect your deliverability, especially if you're linking out to um, uh, a, a, an address with like a really low domain authority or, or whatever it is. Um, and I think also like with, with attachments, don't, don't send emails with attachments because that's how spammers actually um, or hackers actually penetrate your your uh, computer is they get you to click on a link or they get you to open an, an attachment. So mm -hmm. try to actually just get in a conversation with them. Yeah. Um, but I, I do like what you said, Max, about the signature. So we have ah. links in our signature to content. So yeah. you know we wrote the clear and complete guide to account based marketing and sales development. I link that in my signature and the other benefit of that is okay they now click the link, then they go to that page. Now we've tracked, they, we've uh, captured their IP, and now we can actually serve them some really top of funnel awareness ads that are just kind of below their conscious awareness, so we're not screaming in front of their face, so that next time we send out a cold email, it's not as cold. It's a little bit more yeah. warmed up. So yeah, and plain text. I mean, you, that'll keep you out of spam boxes, and that's a that's a good way to go. Um, we got some people asking about gifts as well. I think like gifts are something you really be, need to be careful with and know your audience. So if you're sending one-off email and you can find a way to gauge, you know, their tone. They're on Twitter. They're on LinkedIn. What are they sharing? If you can, if like, if you can 
basically find enough information to go on that says, okay, these people are are kind of you know with it or you know in a modern mind mindset, then uh, you know you can probably send a gift and it'll work. But if if you're sending gifts to people who um, you know maybe aren't on any social networks and like aren't you know, very interested in like the, the you know, the new generation, they might not respond positively to it. Um, and, you know, if you're doing a, a Hail Mary or something like that or one of those alligator emails or trying to get somebody yeah. back on the line to differentiate, differentiate yourself or, you know, add comedy, then you're already pretty much in like that Hail Mary state. And then maybe at that point, you know, you can try it out. Um, I've seen varying reactions to the gift stuff, and it's mostly people that are like in large corporations that are maybe a little bit more old school that are just like this is unprofessional. Yeah. Um, but then no, there, you know not. there are people who are like, yeah. Then there are people like, okay, this was cool. It stood out a little bit. Just know your audience exactly. Perfect, love it. Um, we, we can we can blow through these last few pretty quickly. Um, the the obvious mistake on this one, well, you know, again, aside from the subject line. This is just a straight up mail merge. He grabbed that from he grabbed my title and company from LinkedIn and a location from LinkedIn, did a simple mail merge and blasted it out. Um, and then also with, with this one, so I hate it when the PSs or the signatures are as long or longer than the email itself. And in this case, it was as long and it had a bunch of links and it had a bunch of um, images and that was just like so distracting from the email um, going back to what we were saying earlier like have one clear call to action and don't give them a lot of different things to do get the meeting and that's freaking it um, uh, and other otherwise like you're they're getting way too distracted. They don't know what to do, um, and it it actually shows that you haven't actually done your homework at all. Mm -hmm. All right, let's let's blow through some follow ups. So I have got two follow ups. We've all seen this follow up before. So this is a follow up to one of my colleagues here as well. This wasn't picked to me, but we've all had these follow ups before, where it's like. Um, I haven't heard back from you, and it could be for these three different reasons. In this case, it's four different reasons, and in this case, the person put the PS before their signature. Um, so, like all these little things, and the the spacing is off. Um, in this case, I think the person used the the double hard return a little too much, and it's a little too spaced out, and the formatting is just like slightly off. Um, but I think this type of email, the you're not responding because one of these reasons, and one of them is always like uh, you're. Uh, let's see, you're you're trapped underneath something heavy and can't reach the phone. Like the cutesy, funny email, like that used to work maybe two or three years ago, but these days it it just doesn't work. It at least got a reaction from someone, but I think it's just another one of those things that has become so overused and now ineffective. To the point where, whenever you see it, um, you know it's just a spam email. It's not new. You just automatically delete it. It's kind of like banner blindness in in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s. Like when when banner ads first came on, like everyone would click on banner ads. You would get super high click throughs and conversions, and then everyone became blind to them, and no one would click on ba banners anymore. Um, it's the same with these cold emails. When something works, it only works for a certain amount of time before people catch on and then everyone starts doing it and then it's an automatic flag of you know now to delete that. You can ignore that. Um, so those are the main things that stood out in this email for me. All right, this yep, second, I agree. I agree. second email here. Um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the same things popping up, um, but this one, there's like no context to this at all. There's no thread, there's no reply, there, there's no nothing. 
just wanted to float this to the top of your, I, I don't know what you're floating to the top of my inbox, and I'm, there's no way in hell I'm going to go figure out and see what your first actual email was. Um, so it is, there's, there's only one call to action, fine. Um, but the subject line actually is slightly disconnected to the body itself. Tuesday, and then you have some time to chat next week. So um, I, I found that one um, pretty annoying as well. All right, let's get to some of the good cold emails. Um, so this one, this one was actually slightly decent up until the call to action. So this person found me on LinkedIn. They looked at what I do. They say, hey, I do something very similar. Um, we have a dating startup, and I do something similar at our dating startup. And then the big disconnect for me was, would you happen to be single? It's like, whoa, like record scratch right there, right? And I think it's like this was someone who found me on LinkedIn, a professional network, sent to my work email, and it's then ask me a very personal question. Would you happen to be single? Um, that, was, that was the big disconnect. Other than that, it's actually a decent email. Um, all right, I think we can move on to the next one. In spite of time, we're coming, coming close to the hour here. Um, this was a good one that was actually sent to John, our CEO. Um, this guy actually clearly did his work. He actually connected with one of our other colleagues here. Charlie, our director of marketing, and he actually states that in the email. He makes it personal. He makes it relevant. That one is a little bit long. Um, the key here is that it's not just, hey, I'm going to pitch you something. It's, hey, here's some context. I was talking with Charlie. So if you swap out, you know, John's name and put, you know, Jim, CEO of another company, it makes absolutely no sense, right? So that's that's actually a test that I use a lot. Like customization is a, is different than personalization. So if you mm -hmm. can swap out name, company, title with someone else and send it to them and it still makes sense, it's my contention that it's a bad email. Um, I want something where it's like, if you sent this email to my colleague Charlie and he read it and he goes, that doesn't make any sense, that makes more sense for Brandon, um, and then, you, uh, of course, then it's me. That, in my contention, is, is a good email. So that's one of the tests that I use. Um, and then I also, whenever I'm writing it, writing emails, even if it's going to be a blast email, I write it to one person. If I know Max is going to get this email, I'm actually going to sit down and say, hey, Max, it was good to see you at, you know, uh, in New York last week. And then I'll write that email directly to him. And then I'll go back and put my token in for first name and whatever else it might be. So that's a good way to actually make yeah. sure they're personalized. Yeah, you can, and you can, if you're doing like dynamic emails, you can pull in, you know, just like you can pull in high first name, you can pull in personal intro line and make that yeah. the first line of the, of the email. Yep, yeah, just make it another, um, you know, call me in your mail merge or whatever it is, or if you're exactly. using something like Engageo, um, you can make sure that that, email does not go out unless there is a personal handwritten note in there. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So I know we're coming down on time here. We'll go through these uh, five tips really quickly. Um, so this is actually exactly what we were just talking about, right? Like you talk and, you know, sound like a person. Be human. Write to another person. Um, yeah, a lot of these we've already been talking about a lot anyway. I always have one definitive call to action. Don't ask them to do five different things. Have one specific thing. Um, and then maybe in your second email ask for the other thing or your third or fourth email. But stick to one per email and don't bash your competition. Like that's really just unprofessional and very off-putting, well, especially for, for me. If I get an email where you're bashing like, uh, or bashing your competition, maybe it's someone that I use, um, that to me is unprofessional and I immediately throw that in the trash. Um, and keep it, keep it very simple. Uh, plain black text sans serif font. That's it. And then um, 
kind of what we were saying. We've been saying um, with the graphics, don't use um, large images. Don't attach a lot of things. Um, don't put in a lot of HTML. Oh, there should be no HTML essentially in there um, because that really is going to be picked up by the spam filters and could hurt not your deliverability but your entire company's deliverability. Mm -hmm. All right. So oh, it is. So, yeah, we're we're uh, we're gonna email everybody uh, the ebook if you haven't already got it, so that you'll have it. I, heard, I saw some questions coming in on that. Um, and you have the link right there. To go get it, uh, Brandon. I think we had a couple people mention that they couldn't download it from that link. So just make sure they can download it from that link. But um, thanks to Tom, Brandon. This was awesome. Go get the ebook. There's a lot more content in it than that we went than what we went over. Um, I know a lot of people are talking about more, you know, good emails. It's um, it's tough to to like write a good email for a group of 300 people that's going to be relevant to everyone. It's more like a workshop thing. Yeah. Um, and so it's tough to say, okay, this is a good email for someone, this is a good email for someone. So just take a lot of the little things and use that to piece together an email that goes towards your persona, towards your buyer, at whatever revenue level they're at, however you're you know, running your business right now. I don't know how many reps you have, what your deal size is, or any of that other information. Um, also, who you're selling to. It's different for somebody selling to plumbers. Um, and then you know somebody else selling to CTOs. Um, so you know, we'll, maybe we'll do some actual hands-on workshops for that. But it's tough to to fit into a webinar. But thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, please go out and and get the ebook, spread the word, and uh, thank you, Brandon. Uh, that was awesome. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Max. Talk to everyone soon.